Hello all, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 1 16th scale German radio controlled King Tiger. Unlike my other smaller scale model showcase videos in which those models are built for commission and belong to private collectors, this model here was built and is owned by a relative. While he was doing some maintenance on the model, he had a little accident which caused the paint job to be ruined. He delivered the model to me for me to give the model a polished up paint job and to repair any damages that were done to it. Unlike most of the other 116 scale King Tigers that you probably see on YouTube or in hobby shops, which are the full option variant, this model here is actually the older clutch drive King Tiger tank and features a lot of more primitive functions in it than the newer versions of the tank. We will also go into some of those features in this video as well. The model itself was built in the mid to late 1990s. Back then, the Tamiya Full Option models, as well as even the DMD, didn't exist yet. At that time, this kit was the only mass-produced, large-scale model kit of a radio-controlled King Tiger. They also had their Porsche Tiger out at that time too, but that model was static. During that time, this King Tiger kit was still in production and was fairly prolific. Their other 116 scale models, however, were not. Their Leopard was, was recently phased out of production at this time, and their Gepard, as well as their M4 Sherman, were very rare and were also very expensive during this time frame. Let's have a quick walk around the model. This model was a little bit different than my usual builds in that the model itself was in very good condition. It was well taken care of and also the previous builder put a good amount of effort into upgrading the models molded in detailing by replacing them and replacing them with some of his own. The model's paint pattern is also identical to the way the model was painted originally with both the blotch location as well as even the original paints that were used. The only difference is that the weathering is slightly different than the way it was first built and the airbrush that was used is on this version of the paint job was a more higher quality than the one that was used to put the original paint pattern on the model. In addition to replacing some of the molded in parts with better surface details, the previous builder also upgraded the model's functionality as well as replaced some of the stock Tamiya components with better aftermarket ones as they became available over time. More specifically, the builder replaced the stock Tamiya idler mounts with a better aftermarket set. The stock Tamiya idler mounts were actually a poor design and always caused the track slippage. The tank never really would operate properly until this little piece was changed. Once that design was changed with the aftermarket one, the tank's performance greatly improved. While we're on the lower suspension, I might point I should point out that all of the model Zerk fittings have been painted in red. This is a common feature found on these German tanks, as well as most AFV. Painting the little molded in Zerk fittings red really makes them pop and gives the model a nice unique detail feature. Another part of the lower hull that was modified by the previous builder was actually the front plate. As most of you know, the Tamiya model features a pressed sheet aluminum lower hull. Because of that, it is missing the detail portions of the front puzzle pieces for the model's armor plate. The previous builder fabricated these pieces out of thin sheet styrene and then simply mounted to the hull along with their welds. The model's rear portion is pretty much stock. One modification that was made over time was the removal of the model's large radial whip antenna. 
these Tamiya kits originally had a large bracket that was bolted to the hull emerge from the rear deck. And then a very large spring whip antenna would come out and that would be your RC radio. Now, this antenna is obviously not realistic and does hurt to look at the model. What was done was the original aerial base was deleted and the antenna was moved to its proper location on the rear portion of the hull. By doing this, the model's aerial function is still kept, the antenna range is, is still the same, and it blends in better with the hull detailing, as this antenna is here on the real tank. Another function and feature that was built into the model by the previous builder was that of the main power switch. The original Tamiya kit was designed so that you have the main power switch emerging from the rear portion here of the hull alongside the large whip antenna. Obviously that hurts the look of the model, so rather than having using that design, he went ahead and modified the jack block to conceal the main power switch. The power switch is still an easily accessible part of the model. It doesn't, you don't need any umbilical cords, whatever, if you were mounting it into the turret. And it's very easy to get to. You simply hinge down the block, turn the tank on or off, and you close the block and you're ready to go. The previous builder also liked the look of the large claws which are used in order to hook up the tow cables. A long time ago, he fabricated his own claws out of styrene and liked the look so much that he requested to have them left on the model after the rebuild. Moving our way to the model's rear deck, the model's owner did put a lot of effort into super detailing this section here. If you notice, the model features mesh grill work over the fan grills. At this time, the photo etch grill covers were not available and were non existent. All these grill covers here are scratch built. A recent addition to his model was the addition of the drainage plugs and conduits that we see here. These pieces here were all fabricated out of wire and bits of brass. It is a mirror image on the reverse side of the model. Another feature that was added by the owner was the replacement of the molded in handles on all the hatches. All of the molded in handles were deleted and new wire ones were fabricated in their place. This also is true for not only the bow hatches but also the hatches on the turret. The model's owner also went ahead and added a light bulb to the Bosch light. However, he never got around to hooking up an electrical circuit for making the light actually functional. However, the bulb is there, it just needs its internal wiring complete. Moving our way to the model's turret, the owner fabricated his own track mounting racks that we have positioned here on the turret. The original Tumia kit, these important hooks were missing. In lieu, they had the plastic track links that would simply just get glued on to the model surface. He didn't like that design, so he went ahead and fabricated his own track mounting racks out of pieces of strips of brass. This is done on both sides of the turret and is a mirror image of each other. All of the model actually features enhanced weld beads as well as torch cut lines and the owner also went ahead and applied a roll steel cast texture to the turret as well as other various pieces of the model. Another modification that was made by the model's builder was that he modified the rear escape hatch. The escape hatch on the stock kit is meant to be glued in static in place and he modified it so that it's fully functional. Not only did he modify the hatch, he added some basic interior detailing. The purpose for making the hatch function is so that he can get access to the model's photo strobe controls which are on the inside portion of the turret. Moving our way to the model's copula, the copula has affixed to the machine gun ring an MG42. This is inaccurate in that the Tiger II would have utilized an MG34T for use as an anti-aircraft machine gun. It wasn't until post-war World War II when the Bundeswehr utilized the MG3 for this role. As for the purposes why Timmy included an MG42 as the anti-aircraft machine gun, 
This is probably because it's to save on tooling costs in that Timia already had the mold for the MG42 left over from their 116 scale Leopard 1A4. As per the kit, the model also features a functional commander's copula, which opens up like the real tank in that it opens and swivels out of the way. The model also came with a crew member to be fixed to the top of the turret like so. One piece to keep in mind is that this model here does not have gun elevation. These early Tamiya kits did not feature that function until much later on with the, with the advent of the full option kits. The gun barrel itself is a static piece and is only adjusted by your hand. Because of this, the long heavy gun barrel puts a lot of strain on the trunnion which is located on the interior portion of the kit. Because of that, the gun will want to have a tendency to drop down and stay in this knocked out down position. In order to fix it, it's a simple fix, but you need to go inside the interior of the turret with two drops of CA and put them in the trunnion. The CA hardens and it keeps the piece nice and stiff without permanently locking it in place. As for the model's paint pattern, the model's paint pattern is that of the octopus bubble pattern, which is common on late Tiger II's at the tail end of World War II. As for the model's tools, the model's tools are all stock Tamiya. Most of the tools were repainted and reweathered, and then simply remounted to the vehicle. One thing to keep of note is that on the model's tow cables has the gun cleaning rods built in. On the real Tiger II, these cleaning rods would have been made out of wood, wooden poles, with brass end caps for the screw fittings. By simply painting the end caps with a brass paint, you get a nice little popping look going on with your gun cleaning rods. This same advice can also be used on Tiger ones as well. One modification was also made to the transport track removal cable. If we notice, there has to, there's a small blister here in this section of the cable. This is because with the addition of the small little filler pipe, the stock tow cable didn't fit in its proper location. To make it fit, I had to carefully heat up the tow cable and bend it around the tube. Because of this little hump that was added, I actually had to stretch out the entire cable in order for it to fit back into its kit supplied holes. If done properly, the entire cable stretching will be seamless. This old vintage model kit is a lot different than its newer contemporary unit in that all of the electronics on the interior are all analog. This model is pretty advanced in that it does feature main drive as well as turret rotation and even gun flash. Unlike the newer kits in which the gun barrel recoils and the whole tank judders back as well as having a sound system, this tank is absent all of that. When you hit the trigger, the only thing that you will see is the flash of the photostrobe in the main gun. The photostrobe is also separately powered from the rest of the unit as is the turret rotation motor. Take apart the model, I will first remove the turret. All of these vintage Tamiya tanks have this similar system. You have a main turn gear with an interrupter. Unlike the modern tanks which have that snap feature, these tanks here have a spring-loaded little turn wheel that gives you enough friction to turn the turret However, it's strong enough for the main drive wheel to actually turn the turret. This long protrusion rod that you see here is, the, is actually the, what triggers the photostrobe. There is a, a small little impact switch, and when the servo is triggered, it moves a plate which impacts the steel rod, thus hitting the button and causing the gun barrel to flash. The problem with this turret turner system is that if this little bearing here gets loose, the turret turner will spin, however the, the turret itself will remain in its static location. The tank disassembles as the same way that the current Tiger one does as well. You have two small Phillips screws in the back. You simply unscrew them. And the whole deck will just slide right off. And there we have it. And here's the interior of the model. One thing as of note is that if we notice the 
King Tiger from Tamiya, and I believe this is true on the, the current release, does not have a sponson covering up the hull. It's sponsonless. Unlike vehicles like the Tiger One, where there's Sherman, in which this piece is closed off, the interior is left open for any dirt and debris that can be kicked up by the tracks to end up on the interior. This not only makes the interior very filthy, but if you have an analog system like this, or even with the current system with an exposed gearbox, obstructions can get into the model and possibly cause problems. The way this model functions is via a clutch system. If we notice, it is a, it's powered by one single very large motor. This motor is in turn powers two gears, which makes its way via drive shafts down to the final drives and into the track. The system is somewhat complicated in that the way the tank is controlled is by this system here. If we notice this plastic little box, which is controlled via a servo, actually closes and grabs onto the drive shaft of these two turning gears. By doing that, the piece actually restrains the drive shaft from turning, thus allowing the model to turn. If I move the servo, you can see. Because of this gearbox system that we have here, the model operates and feels differently when you're driving it compared to your standard electronic dual motor geared system like that we have on all contemporary modern radio control tanks. Namely in that the model is a lot less responsive to immediate controls and feels more chunky while driving it. Another feature about this gearbox is that it does not allow for neutral steer capabilities. Now on tanks like the King Tiger, that's incorrect. However, on tanks like the Tamiya M4 Sherman, which originally had this gearbox, actually makes the model more accurate because the real Sherman tank could not neutral steer in real life. Also driving this tank, it has, since it's all analog, it act and has an actual clutch system like driving a real tank, technically this system here has a much more realistic feel to the controls than that of a DMB equipped tank. As what was mentioned previously, the model has a turret turning system that is different from that on the normal Tamiya tanks of, that are being manufactured now. The way the model, can, the way the tower turners are made nowadays is that it's all electronically controlled and plugs into the DMD unit. Back when this tank was developed in the 1970s and the early 1980s, the way this was facilitated was with a very rudimentary system. That system involved a three-way switch and the servo. Now, this unit here is not stock Tamiya, as, and the model itself has been upgraded over the years. The original Tamiya unit was featured a very rudimentary three-way switch that would have been positioned in this location over here. The problem with the Tamiya switch is that it is such poor quality and cheaply made that after a while the switch will literally fall apart. In order to make the system work, the stock Tamiya switch was replaced by a double pole double throw switch which was wired to have the motor go in reverse in a very similar way as the original Tamiya one did. As for how to hook up the switch, a tutorials can be found on the internet as well as YouTube how to hook up the same system with a three-way switch. This turret turning system is vastly different in both design as well as the way it's electronically controlled from its modern contemporary Tamiya counterparts. Unlike the modern design which utilizes a small gearbox on the corner, this gearbox is a very large geared system that is solid and does not allow any interruption between the gear and the motor. There are several gears in a step down format in order to facilitate the turret turner. The basic idea of how the switch works is that the motor is actually powered by a separate battery source which is this one over here. The switch in the middle is in the off position. When the servo is actuated by the radio it turns on. If we notice the turret is, would be turning. If the servo goes in the other direction 
the motor now goes in the opposite direction. There is no main cutoff for this battery power as the, there's, as the switch is the cutoff. And the servo is connected to the radio, so once the tank is off, the servo will be off, and thus so will be the turret turner motor. The only time this battery ever gets used is to turn the turret. So it actually does not use very much battery power at all for this application. This model features an electronic speed controller. However, the model, the kit itself is so old that it originally intended for use of a mechanical speed controller. Moving our way back, we have here the improved aftermarket idler system, which is highly recommended for use on these Tamiya King Tiger tanks. Also back here, if anyone's wondering, this is an actual miniature smoke system that was fabricated by the owner of the model, however, has never been fully hooked up and has never been tested. Also, if we see back here, this is that indentation I was referring to earlier about the on and off switch. This little plate here is still present on the current releases of the King Tiger as it's a carryover from this unit here. As for the gun flash, that is controlled by this servo we have here, which has been epoxied to the gearbox. On the end, there's a long arm with a plate on it. This plate's job is to glide and hit this rod, which will cause the gun to fire. As I mentioned before, the photostrobe unit is built inside the turret. If we notice, the photostrobe unit uses two C batteries and has a main cutoff switch that was positioned inside the tank. It can be set for three positions. It can be set for off, it can be set for triggered, and it can be set for duration. Once it's powered on, the unit can be activated when the trigger is pulled. The, as we noticed, the piece, the, the gun flashed, however, there's no sound, as there's no sound card in this tank. The same design of the photostrobe, this is actually the grandfather of the current photostrobe units that are found in the Tamiya 116 scale tanks of today. If I move the switch to the other position, it will just cycle through its flashing with no control at all. Now that the model is back in one piece, we'll now take it out to do for some test driving. Thank you. 